Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Snake Pit Podcast, your one and only stop for all things entertainment, all things homegrown. Coming to you out of Toledo, Ohio, I'm your host, Jake Paluski. You can follow us at jakepaluski.com. That's P I L E W S K I. The Snake Pit. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is, uh, this is going to be quite a treat uh, here at the Snake Pit Podcast. Um, we've been talking for a while how we want to change some things up and, uh, you know, maybe get some folks on here, uh, who have, you know, been a jack of many trades and have taken, you know, different routes throughout life in the arts and, uh, and a big part of the arts too, as we all know is education. And, um, they're very, very much uh, go hand in hand, um, as we have some great talent coming out of TSA here in Toledo and, uh, and, you know, we've had a lot of great Toledo-based talent, uh, you know, get their start here and, you know, venture elsewhere. But, you know, it's great to have them come back and kind of give some peace of mind and give some, you know, knowledge and education itself about where they've gone, why they've gone there, how they got there, as well as even having an open discussion about certain, you know, hot topics at hand. You know, that's been something we've been uh, trying to get more involved in so you guys can take a little more out of it. So... Well, I'll stop, you know, blabbing. I, uh, I'm excited to have a longtime friend, a former bandmate. A, uh, I mean, he's been a stand-up comedian, um, therefore a writer. Uh, you can't be a stand-up comic without being a great creative writer. You can be a bad stand-up comedian and a bad writer, though. That's, that's, that's possible. <laughs> right. But I, uh, yeah, I will try to make it a treat, I promise. So this is George Smith, ladies and gentlemen. That's the guy talking. You know, that's that's the guy without my voice. That's George Smith. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, thanks for having me. I'll, full disclosure, I, I pretty much asked to be here, but I, uh, it's, uh, it's still a pleasure that you that you said yes. Well, I, I I couldn't think of you know what a better guy to bring in here that has you know gone on out of you know out of town but has come back here i mean you've come back here a number of times and done comedy shows i mean you filled the funny bone uh and i know you and lorenzo did one i think it was what uh, one or two years ago now yeah yeah we did a uh kind of a story based uh comedy show there's a uh, a comedy series that's on youtube it's called uh, i believe it's this can't be happening or this isn't happening and it's um ari shafir runs it and it's actually uh they run it out of like a uh, like a burlesque house on uh, this really cool stage and it's all these comedians coming up and telling uh stories that are themed so this is uh, stories about love stories about uh war stories about you know whatever it might be and these comedians kind of stick to that theme so lorenzo and i liked the idea of doing that and we got uh six or seven local comics on to tell to tell stories uh, because it was the night before Thanksgiving oh, yeah. and obviously everybody's going out that night drinking so we thought it would be a good spot for everyone to come together and kind of hear some stories and get laughing and you know get ready to go out to the bar from there and it went really well it was, it was a it was a perfect way to go in the holidays especially you know for me I've worked retail and uh, to go into that that's the crazy weekend and uh, it was it was a blast and then you guys packed the place I think more than even uh you know, funny bone even realize uh, what happened. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's been pretty. You know? you know, there's uh there's been a couple times that I've come home, uh, and and actually enough people have bought tickets to come to the shows that the place is sold out on two different occasions, which is not only shows you uh, Toledo's support for comedy and for the arts, but it just shows you how supportive they are of their own. You know, that was pretty cool because, you know, in California, I do comedy for like six comedians and their girlfriends. You know, and then you come here and you get to sell a place <laughs> out. It was kind of a cool experience, and uh, I definitely appreciated that. Oh, absolutely. And even long before that, I mean, you were playing in bands. I mean, we've talked, you know, you would go down to Frankie's. I mean, you were still in high school, right? I mean, as a Paris, but graduate. I mean, weren't you still in high school when you were playing a lot of the different punk bands? And yeah, stuff? I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah. My buddy, uh, that was a, that was a great time period. My buddies and I, we started a, um, it was originally a, a six piece ska band with, you know, a horn section and everything. We originally were called the Cracker Jack Kings, but then we heard <laughs> of the Cottonmouth Kings. And we were like, okay, we got to kind of stem off this. So uh, our buddy, Ryan Deering, uh, who you know as well he he decided that the band was going to be called the wet bandits a la home alone too home alone yeah and so it was like these six 16 year old kids uh driving to do these local shows a couple of the guys had like chaos spike mohawks ryan had uh these blonde chaos spikes all throughout his head and uh uh yeah we were playing we were playing shows with uh, other punk bands and we would actually rent out vfw halls in the area we'd pay the money to, uh, to rent the VFW halls out, and then we'd all stay to clean it up to make sure we got the deposit back by you know charging five bucks for people to get in. So uh, it was really cool that sixteen year old kids were were you know consciously trying to put shows together. But wow, the yeah. VFW halls were really close close to the uh, police and fire station. So eventually, like 
you know, they got upset about the noise and they shut it down, which was a little disappointing because, again, you know, it was all in all mostly clean fun. You know, we were just trying to to have a, a way to uh, to play our terrible music for as many people as we could. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, that's a lot of it. It's, I mean, that's the thing. You know, you're 16 years old. I mean, a lot of people that have been on here, I mean, they've had the... Uh, the pleasure and the privilege to, you know, I mean, since you've gone, you know, since you've been gone, there's been, you know, such a resurgence and a renaissance going on with Toledo and, and you know, the bars and the and the music scene and, and in, a, in a different, in a really different way. Um, downtown Toledo's in the best shape it's been in, in uh, probably over 30 years. And uh, and it's fantastic. But, you know, this is a foreign concept to uh to go in and pay to play at a place and, and then be clean it up afterwards because I mean all these places now are having live music and they're right. paying the artists and it's it's a wonderful wonderful thing so yeah but yeah. you know and that's but that's a big part of you know why I wanted to have you on here because you've got uh, quite a storied history to tell uh, in many avenues um, I hope so yeah I hope so yeah I mean well tell 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 everybody out there you know a little bit of more about more who george smith is you know how how you i mean because i know you originally from new jersey correct mm, yeah once upon a time yep and uh and then you moved to perrysburg what was it right around when you were 10 years old yeah yeah it's probably about 10 years old yep cool and then uh so you stayed in perrysburg though i mean you graduated from perrysburg made a lot of your friends here you got your you know comedic start here you went to bowling green right yeah yeah i got really lucky uh kind of getting into the comedy scene my freshman year uh which was interesting because uh, a, a guy you've actually had on the show lorenzo uh people were trying to get me to do stand-up comedy i'd been writing stand-up comedy uh for quite a few years you know i was writing it in high school but i never really had the outlet to do it or, or really understood how to get it done and uh i met a guy i believe it was uh, a guy named kyle wells he was in town and he was trying to do stand-up he was a younger guy and he told me that there was a number you could call at Wednesday at noon or something, and you could be get five minutes at uh, what was Comedy Connections here yeah. in Toledo. It uh, went out of business, which is too bad. It was a really outstanding club. And uh, I didn't really have the guts to do it myself, so I called Lorenzo Melcher, and I told him, uh, hey, at noon, call this number, and if they answer, tell them my name, and I'm going to try to do five minutes. And so he did. And uh, it was funny because it was like 21 and over club and I showed up at like 18, 19 years old and I wasn't <laughs> even supposed to be there and uh, they were going to pay me in drinks, but they couldn't do that. So I basically had to like just sit in a chair in the back and, um, and, and, you know, there's an earlier show where my friends could come, but I, I, I was, I like kind of had to stay away from the bar and count uh, your blessings. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but, the, but then, you know, in, uh, even in Bowling Green, they had a, a competition there. Uh, I got tremendously lucky with that because there was about 12 comics that they had compete to do the best five minutes. And uh, the winner was going to get to open for Dane Cook, who at the time was like the name in huge. comedy. He was, yeah, it was huge. He blew up overnight almost. He, right. Yeah, he did. And uh, and I and I was able to, to take that. And um, that's kind of an interesting story, actually, because when I got there, I was super nervous because it was a sold out arena at a college and I'd only done shows for like family and friends. And uh, they told me you're actually not allowed to do stand-up tonight. You're just going to introduce him. So I was half relieved <laughs> and half disappointed because I thought I'd won the opportunity to open for him. And so I was uh, I was standing outside the, the curtain, and there's this old guy running the sound booth. And he goes, uh, you know, what's the matter with you? And I basically told him, oh, I thought I was going to get to open for him, but they said I can only go out and say his name. And the guy goes, well, I'm running the microphone, and I'm not going to shut it off no matter what you decide to do, so get out there. And I had to make the yes. split-second decision to, to go against what the uh, university activity organizations had told me I could do. And I went out there and I did five minutes anyway because I wanted to be able to say that I opened for a, you know, a major touring comic. So I kind of, I basically like stole five minutes. Yeah. Well, those are those Stick rock and roll band. roots, punk rock roots. Right. Through, right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't have the Mohawk anymore, but I guess the mentality <laughs> was still there. Well, you had to seize the moment. And plus, I mean, it's, it's almost unheard of to be an MC at a comedy show without without having your own set i mean yeah they gave me like a list of rules they're like no flash photography and please stay in your seats i'm like i'm not just gonna go out there and read rules and then go home is yeah so i yeah. did it anyway because yeah. then you're the guys that people throw things at instead of right. the actual mc I yeah mean, yeah i mean you're a security with a microphone at that point essentially <laughs> yep yeah but uh, and it, it was cool too because you know you, you hear a lot of people you know talk smack about uh dane cook and i mean i, I understand that you know he's considered to kind of be the frat boys comic but uh, I got the opportunity to be backstage with him for a while. And again, you know, I'm 19 years old. So the guy's like, you know, heroic to me, basically. And he's got this little miniature uh, Doberman. And he puts this miniature Doberman on the ground and he goes, uh, this is Beast, which is funny because, again, this dog weighed like two pounds. And he goes, uh, Beast can backflip. 
<laughs> and so he's, yeah, I'm really, you know, it's, and it's him and I sitting there watching this dog. And he goes, uh, beast, flip, flip, beast, beast, flip. And, and this goes on for, you know, for like two, three minutes. And then he just looks at me. He's like, nah, that dog can't flip. I'm just messing with him. So he, was, he was actually a really nice guy. He's a nice guy who, who's, uh, I think, comedy career has taken a really bad turn. Well, and I'm sure that's, you know, he was... Well, that was probably what two thousand and uh, that was two thousand and nine. Two thousand nine, yeah. yeah. Um, because I mean, he really started blowing up by two thousand seven, even two thousand eight. Uh, he started getting movies, you know, right around then, shortly thereafter. Which I know uh, Owen Thomas and I kind of joked about, where you know, like Dan Cook's old thing about how as soon as you get really good at comedy, they yeah. ask if you can write yeah. and if you can act. It and... probably didn't help that those <laughs> movies, every movie he's made has been absolutely terrible. But um... <laughs> can you imagine going up to Jim Morrison though, like once upon a time, be like, you know, you're really good at what you do, but can you dance? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he'd probably be too strung out to even answer. <laughs> but no, I don't, I don't think he would. I don't think he'd be dancing for you. <laughs> so it's 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 this weird thing about about comedy. But I mean, it's uh, yeah. What a, what a, what an awesome opportunity. I mean, yep. Dan Cook, and that's uh, well, you have that forever too. Yeah, yeah. And you went cool. out and did it, and now you don't have to live with the regret of uh, not doing it. Yeah. Of well, yeah. Of of actually, you know, just going and reading the rules, and and that's a big part of you know having you on here too, is because it's like you know people like you got to take a chance, and I think sometimes a lot of the uh, the music industry or the art in general, uh, in the mainstream at least for the past 10, 15 years, has suffered from worrying too much about if you're going to sell or not. And it's kind of created this this inorganic kind of experience. I mean... And, you know, I, it's, I actually uh, have noticed that from following kind of your, the music that you're doing from, uh, from afar. Um, you know, you've obviously always had a, a real talent for music and you've surrounded yourself with people who, who have as well. But I noticed that there were time periods where I felt that you were doing what you know, people, you thought you, your impression was that people wanted this kind of music right. or that kind of music. And I, and I think that lately, over the past few years, I've, I've seen you really kind of embrace what what seems like what you want to do. Yeah. And, and I think that you've been producing some of the best music that you've, that you've done. And well, so that, it's cool to watch that happening. Yeah. Plenty more to come. And that's, Good. uh, and that's, you know, that was a lot of it was from just from advice from, you know, people coming on here and, and then this is an education experience for me and that's, uh, and it's priceless too. I mean, that's, uh, I went to college, you know, two different places for about four, four or five years. I mean, it's sporadically. And I think I've gotten some of the best education just through, playing music with people you know sitting down and talking to people Mm -hmm. and uh in all walks of life people that you've surpassed perhaps you know in the same trade and and the people that you know maybe you look up to but either way i mean you learn something from everybody if you allow yourself absolutely so well um so going along with that when was it about the time that you made the move to uh california so i went to uh and actually when we did that comedy show with uh where we were telling the stories my story was about um being a student teacher in rio de janeiro brazil and getting out of a a mugging by accident that's right yeah Uh, yeah a guy uh, was was trying came out of a an alley with his his hand under his shirt you know like they do in cartoons almost (laughs) pretending there's a gun under their shirt and maybe there was i don't know but uh I reached into my jacket, like into the breast side of my jacket, to to pause my iPod, and uh, the guy <laughs> thought I was reaching for a gun, also, and just took off running down the alley. And then that kind of told an extension of that story. But I had uh, gone to, to to Rio, and I think being in Rio de Janeiro was a really eye-opening experience for me. That I did want to keep seeing things, and I wanted to be in the warmth. I, I realized that pretty quick because it was the least depressing winter of my life. Um, and so uh, while I was there, I got a call from a guy. Who was uh, who had stayed in Bowling Green and was uh, at a teacher hiring fair, and uh, they hired him to be a PE teacher. And they asked, "Do you know any English teachers?" And uh, so they, I sent them my resume and I did an interview over the phone. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been to Joshua Tree National Park no. before. Okay, so it's a, I mean, it's it's a great place if you're a climber or you like the desert or whatever for a week or so. But I basically was teaching in the town right outside Joshua Tree National wow. Park, and. Uh, it's again awesome as a vacation destination, but like when I pulled into this town, <laughs> I joke that like there was like a uh, like a like a crow on a rusty tricycle that was just like ah, as you came in and you're like oh my gosh where am I? It was uh, it was a very small, uh, very poor town, um, but that's where I got my start. Was working with those kids uh, for a year. I was teaching uh, middle school. I was teaching uh, English seventh and eighth. Now that year was just seventh grade English at a middle school outside Joshua Tree National Park and. Um, and what part cool. of the state is that in? That's in Southern California. Southern California. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, now that it kind of rings a bell, aside from that U2 album, uh, 
I believe at one point my fiance Amanda even sent me because she was really about like going out to California, mm-hmm. and she said, "Look, it's not too expensive to live here." Yeah, <laughs> no, it's it's not. And uh, I, from what I from what I noticed while I was there, the meth must also be very very affordable. Uh, but uh, the, it was it's. It, I mean, again, the the it, the, the park is cool. Uh, they, I call it the Joshua trees Dr. Seuss trees because that's what they kind of look like. It's a really trippy uh, area. Um, but as much as I joke that, 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 uh, there were some interesting individuals living out there, um, there, there was also, those kids were, were incredibly open-minded. They, I would play a song of the day every morning and sometimes it would be like Death Cab for Cutie or bands that these guys had never heard of before. Yeah. And the kids would always be writing down the names of the bands and stuff so they could download the songs at home. And, and they were really just really cool, sweet kids. And, uh, there's actually a, a, a bar out there that if you ever do go, it's called Pappy and Harriet's. And the thing that makes this bar so cool is that it's, it's this old saloon in the middle of nowhere. I mean, those big Western swinging doors and like the, the sign banner with the, you know, the big light bulbs around it. And it's really the last place that a, an artist can play an impromptu show um, without, you know, you could post now on Instagram, hey, this band's at this bar. and right. everyone shows, But it's so out in the middle of nowhere that it's not uncommon for like Dave Grohl or Queens of the Stone Age live around that area. And so wow. did the Eagles of Death Metal, they'd show up. Um, but just last year, I guess Paul McCartney was doing Coachella or not. Maybe it wasn't Coachella. Maybe it was the one with the older guys. I think like Dylan and um, yeah. the Rolling Stones were doing a show. Uh, and, and Paul McCartney did like kind of an impromptu show. And even if you saw it on Instagram or social media, it was, it was you're not going to be able to drive two hours out in the middle of the desert in time. So right. if you were lucky enough to be there, you got to see him. That's cool. Yeah. I love the intrigue and the mystique. Mm-hmm. That's <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, before we even get further into the uh, you, you know your education career, which has been now it's such a big part of your life. Yeah. Um, what I mean, explain you know how you got there. How do you, how how you got to a place where you know. I've always known you as, I mean, essentially, I, I'll say the class clown, but yeah. I mean, in, in that instance, I don't mean the class clown the way, you know, the guy that o- the only thing he knew to do was how to make people laugh. I mean, you're a very well-rounded individual and you're very, you know, you're an intelligent guy and like you, <laughs> you know, and, and you, you intrigued people. I mean, everything you have a presence about and you always have, and I mean, you were meant to entertain. And, and I guess I can, I guess that kind of makes sense as to how that goes into education. Because I mean, if you can pull somebody in now, you know, you can take advantage of that situation and really, um, so, I mean, when was it when you decided, you know, I think, you know, I think teaching would be something I'd love to get into. Yeah. Well, you know, it actually kind of does stem back to high school and, and you're right. I, um, I didn't have a reputation of being, um, an incredibly bright guy, but I didn't put a, I didn't put a, uh, a lot of effort into school. And I, I actually remember my sophomore year, I got called down to the office and there was a vice principal at the time. Uh, I won't say his name, even though I really did like this guy. <laughs> this guy was one of the people at the school. I really, we'll hashtag like. it later. Yeah. We can, yeah, we will. And uh, give him some credit. But I remember the guy going, uh, and, and I had gone to a, to a private school. Uh, I got into St. Saint John's my freshman year. And uh, so this was my first year in the school. And he's he kind of had like a southern draw. And he goes, George, you have more detentions from anyone in this school. And it's your first year here. And then he pulls out these little pieces of pink paper. And he goes, you have six detentions from lunch this week alone. <laughs> and and uh, so I, I somehow had racked up like this incredible amount of detentions. And then we, we, we kind of uh, started a food fight that year. I don't know. Were you in our lunch sophomore year when that oh, big food fight? Yeah. Brought? Yep. Yep. Uh, I buried my head. I was, yeah, I was not that outgoing at that point. Yeah. Everybody ran for the sides of the cafeteria. I remember, but, um, but I did get in a, in a fair amount of, uh, of trouble in high school. And it actually wasn't until uh, it was junior year. I got to the to, to the new high school, and there was a uh, a drama teacher there. Uh, his name was Rob Gentry, uh, who I know that you got to work with as well. Changed and, my life. <laughs> yep, my, mine as well. And uh, he 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 would stop me in the hallway, and he'd always ask when I when are you going to join my classes? When are you going to join my classes? Which was um, which was amazing to me because, and I'm not joking when I say this. There was a couple of classes I walked in that I that the teacher told me to go back down to the counseling office, and because they they off reputation, which in Perrysburg I guess wasn't that hard. It's not like you know no. it's like setting fires and beating people up, but no. um, but they didn't want me in their class based off reputation. And this guy was gunning me down to try to 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 try to like recruit me, and uh, and eventually I conceded to that, and I joined uh, you know his his drama course, 
and um, and and his 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 kind of forced exposure to the arts. You know, I'd, I'd done the arts in the sense of painting and ceramics and stuff willingly in the, in the past, but um, he really showed a personal interest in me and showed me how big of a difference it can make. Um, as did uh, another person I know that you worked with, Catherine Halsepian, oh, yeah, uh, was my English time. teacher, and she really encouraged me specifically in in English. And she told my parents uh, in front of me that that I had a brilliance to me about English, and no one had ever spoken to me uh, like that before, or spoken about me positively like that. And uh, those two showed me that just um, you know a little bit of encouragement and personalized interest totally redirected me. You know, I. I, I Actually, ended up taking five classes with Rob Gentry in two years. Wow! Um, he, he because he continuously wanted me in his classes, and and I and I kept touch with Catherine Halsepian, and she and I worked uh, on on some things together even after high school. Um, and I think that's kind of what what really started to draw me in um, because I did go to school initially to be in creative writing. I wanted to write scripts, which I still write and, and do stuff like that. Uh, but eventually, you know, I thought about those experiences a lot and, and the impact that you can have on kids like me who m- were kind of apathetic about school or, or maybe overlooked by people based on reputation. And, and that I think that's what really pushed me to go that direction. Well, yeah. And a lot of teachers, I mean, as, as, as you, you experience and I'm sure you experience as they can be, you know, you know, co-workers that a lot of teachers have a set way and mm-hmm. they'll look at every everything streamlined and you know kids you know as as i mean even as adults different personalities taking information in different ways and i mean let alone when you're going through the crazy times of adolescence and you know and growing up develop developmental stages i mean and not every kid learns the same and you know you have a a lot of you know we grew up with a testing system that essentially taught us to cram 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 right. and not actually retain right. and um and again, you know, as, as, as some teachers wanted to turn you away, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> being yeah. like, you know, he's trouble and, you know, and then there was two other teachers that saw potential in you because, well, there's personality and there's heart there. So right. why don't we tap into that? Because there is good in there. Right. And let's, you know, focus on that. And cause the other stuff's easy. If there's passion in there, like, let's bring that out. And that's yeah. very important as, as a teacher in any role. Right. I mean, even if you're teaching, you know, statistics, like there's, there's ways about it, you know, no doubt. <laughs> and, and I got to kind of experience that end of things, uh, after, you know, I, I loved, I loved my experience working with the kids that I talked about up in Joshua tree. Uh, but I wanted to get down to San Diego and, and, and eventually I, I did transition for a long period to Palm Springs. Uh, and I was working in a school that, that targeted, uh, kids that were considered to be at-risk youth, uh, at-risk high schoolers, and so that that inc- that included um, former dropouts, foster youth, kids who were homeless, pregnant or parenting, had been expelled or had been in the juvenile detention system, and so you're basically looking at kind of like the motley crew of of kids who, you know, that that term at-risk means they're at risk of dropping out of high school and calling it quits, and um, it's incredibly important that we are working with those kids who are dropping out of high school because 7,000 kids drop out of high school in the United States every single day. And that that breaks down to be 26 kids every second. And what I tell people a lot that really blows people away is that if you look at all the crime in the United States, 75% of all of the crime that's taking place in the United States is committed by people who dropped out of high school. And so there's a lot of people who don't want to pay to help these kids or they don't want to pay into education. But if you're thinking that 75 percent of of the crimes that are being committed are by high school dropouts and that half the kids who drop out of high school end up on welfare, you're going to pay for them in in one way or another down the road. Right. And so um, working with kids who are at risk of dropping out. Um, it, it was, it was, it pulled at your heartstrings a lot. I mean, I worked with some gang affiliated youth and, and, um, and, and, you know, I lost some of those kids and, um, and it is, it is a tough gig. Um, but it, it's incredibly important to keep them motivated and to keep them in. And sometimes that personalized interest we're talking about, just, yeah. just being the one to tell them, Hey, I'm, I believe in you. It can, it can, it can turn everything. Yeah. Cause if, you know, you, you for years and years, you only know one way of life and yeah. then, you know, you get everybody telling you this and this and this and, you know, and it's all this negative, negative, negative. And then, you know, this kid might have a lot of potential in a certain area that's no even, even paying attention to it because he's only known one way and or he or she. And then, then you essentially, especially in a situation like that, you know, with the Motley crew, I mean, you essentially can be that voice of reason that really, turns everything around for them we all and, and, and you're yeah. not and you're not necessarily going to 
change every single kid's life. I mean, mm-hmm. but the the fact that you can actually have the opportunity to right. opportunity is what you know is is really all what it's about. I mean, creating opportunity for somebody else, and you know, from there, because so many people think you know when they hear these crime statistics and stuff, and, and it makes me sick. You know, mm-hmm. especially now social media, everybody has a voice. You know, yeah. And that's one thing I do want to say is that. You know, I started a podcast, you right. know, about music. Right. I didn't start it about political science because, you know what? Or I, just I, your life. Yeah. I mean, well, <laughs> you know, because I know, I know music in and out right. very right. much. So, sure, there's people who know more than me. But I'm not going to get out here and talk about, you know, raising a baby because I have no idea. Yeah. You know? But there's, but there's so much, like, journalism out there that they, you know, <sighs> they get the bullet points and they just run off on a tangent about it. And I'm like, but you don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, they, go watch The View, for God's sake. Right. I mean, like, well, yeah, and it's funny that there was a time period where... <laughs> Uh, you know, like you, you, you know, we had to have. I had to have the courage to to do stand up comedy, which was really, really hard to try. You had to have the, the the courage to start a band and get up there and and kind of demand an audience. But like you said, now anyone can can create an account uh, and say like, here's all the important stuff I have to say <laughs> right. about what I had for dinner. And you're right. just like, oh man, it's yeah. There's so much. And but you but I, you can't stop looking at and, it. And well, yeah. And it's then a, people go to war with accident. each other over it. You know, buying the yeah. keyboard. It's the keyboard courage. You know. And so it's important. That, you know, I bring people on here to talk about, you know, what they know, what they Mm -hmm. live. I mean, and that's and that's uh, that alone is education. And so, again, it's like it's fantastic, you know, because you've seen it and you've lived it. And as much as somebody wants to have opinions about some article that they read once upon a time on social media, it's like, no, this is this is reality right here. What's happening? And I didn't mean to, you know, cut into that. But it's 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 true. I mean, this if you I mean, it's not every single kid that, you know, commits a crime and not every single, you know, dropout is, you know, you know, a POS as they you know type it on, you know, there's there's actually a lot of good potential and a lot of these people. Well, it's just sometimes here in a little bit of encouragement, you know, not, not saying, you know, it's okay, Joey, like everything's fine. Right. You know, sometimes tough love is necessary, but sure. still love period one way or another is what's necessary. Right. Or maybe just that kick in the pants saying, you know, this, you know, shape up, you know, sometimes it is that, but you know, when you don't even have that, mm-hmm. like that's, what's a scary situation. And that's what creates these awful, you know, statistics that you speak of. And you're, and you're, you're a hundred percent right. I mean, you said yourself that, you know, that sometimes you look at where these kids come from and you wonder how do they even have a shot in the first place? I worked with a kid whose uncle and father were basically the two kingpins of a pretty established gang, uh, out in the desert. And you, you, you think this kid is like literally the offspring of the bosses of, of a, of a gang. What do you expect is going to happen to this kid? Uh, his brother, I remember he uh, his brother got was running from the police. He had already had two strikes, um, you know, in, in the in the prison system, two violent crimes, and two cop cars were chasing him, and they co- they collided, and one of the cops died, and so the kid the the kid's brother was going to get like the death penalty for having a third strike and having it be at the lives of an officer. And so you're looking at the 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 world that this kid is coming from, and you're expecting that he's going to produce you know, the same things that are going to be produced from a kid from a neighborhood like the one we grew up in. And and it's insane that these schools that, um, they call them dropout factories, which is, you know, 60,000 or 60% of the kids are dropping out. It's considered a dropout factory. And there's 2000 of these high schools in the country where at least 60% of the kids are dropping out. And one in three minority students in the United States are in a dropout factory. And so you, 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 all you got to do is basically look at somebody physically look at look at a kid 18 or below look at the color of their skin and there's a one in three chance that they're going to a school where 60 percent of the kids aren't finishing and you know i think that we we as a country have to kind of take some responsibility for that because we've we've created a system of schools where the neighborhood you grew up in and the money that your family make is directly and correlated to the school you're going to attend and the education that you're going to receive yeah so i i mean and that's insane you know, the, the, I think that we've created something that, that you're never going to break that chain. Yeah, I mean, a, that that the, if you grow up in a poor neighborhood, you're going to go to a school with worse teachers, worse, this, worse aesthetic conditions, with less safety, with less programs like the arts and sports and stuff like that. And then you expect that these kids are going to produce the same thing as kids from our neighborhood. And that's never going to happen. It's no, completely unrealistic. No, it's improbable. I mean, yeah. it's, well, you and I spoke before. Mm-hmm. Uh it boggles my mind, you know, it's how people write, how people write other people off. So easily, so easily where, well, well, they're not, you know, 
everybody has a choice. Well, it's like, yeah, everybody does have a choice. But again, it's just mind boggling that more people don't realize that like the statistics, like they, they speak for themselves. You yeah, know? The, the juxtaposition and, I always make is that to kind of to, to go off your point of people saying, well, if you want it bad enough, it doesn't matter where you grow up. You know, if you, if you want success, if you want to be smart. The, so the no. juxtaposition <laughs> I make is like saying, if, if you wanted to be a professional surfer and you lived in Perrysburg and you're talking to a kid that wants to be a professional surfer that lives in Maui and someone coming to you and being like, well, if you wanted it bad enough, you could be a professional surfer. Yeah, just too. do it. No, just I, do it. You know, I don't have what I need to, you know, it, it's, 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 <laughs> well, then you're lazy. Just as hard. Right. Right. Then you're they, lazy. You didn't try hard enough. <laughs> right. And then that's, that's literally the, the <laughs> this just as tough for, for these kids that are growing up in schools that, that just have, have no outlets for creativity, no, no extra programs, teachers who, who, lack quality education or brand new teachers who that's the only spot that they could find because the, the schools pay so low because it's the money they've got. It's the same thing as looking at these kids that grow up in these schools and saying, hey, if they wanted it bad enough, it's, no, it's, it's, not, it's not a fair start. Those kids do not get the same start that you and I got and, and right. we need to acknowledge that. And whether that's privilege or whatever, whatever hashtag is going around at the time, I mean, it is what it is. And but that, that is, that is, those are the facts. Um, yeah. but there is a flip side to that. I want to ask you, mm-hmm. um, because I've had friends that have taught at charter schools here mm-hmm. in Toledo mm-hmm. and, um, they've had some experiences as, and it's not just charter schools. It's been at, you know, public schools. It's been at private schools, right. uh, because there's been a shift and again, I, I blame it on social media, hands down. Okay. Um, but there's been a shift in parental responsibility uh, to where some of my friends that taught at these charter schools, but again, some of my friends that taught at some of the you know, public schools and private schools where they're, they're trying to discipline or trying to uh, you know, really give a kid some tough love or just, you know, Maybe actually approaching it from a completely peace, love everybody kind of approach to where when the kid's not responding mm-hmm. and the the grades aren't responding accordingly, that the parent wants to blame it on the teacher automatically without maybe taking responsibility for the home situation or even taking responsibility for, hey, maybe my kid just doesn't give a shit. Right. And, and, and you know, in my in my experience, this is not like I, I've got no stats to back this up. Right. But well, in, that's what in, I'm asking you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So in my in my experience, it's actually I've had more comeback from oh, no, not my kid. It's not their fault from more affluent uh, families. You know, if, if you look at the fact, I think it's very tempting to say, oh, parents don't care. Right. But you look at the fact that 72 percent of black children are, are brought up in single home families, 72%. Yeah. So, so you've got, that means that the dominant majority of, of these kids are getting raised by people who are having to support an entire family on their own. So you, you've got people that are working either numerous jobs or you've got uh, kids who are coming in with parents from other countries who don't speak the language and aren't comfortable trying to interact with the school or, or they dropped out of high school themselves so they don't feel competent enough to have a role there or, or, or that they really truly understand it. Yeah. So I, I think it is, it is easy to throw a back on the parents to say they don't care and sometimes that is the case but it's oftentimes more often than not in my experience when people are saying the parents don't care if you actually dig into that kid's home structure and you learn about the parents it's not that they refuse to be involved or they refuse to take responsibility it's that they can't or feel that they can't right and and, and, and i think that's important to to know so do you think it automatically good then goes on the teacher's hands? not every time i definitely right. i definitely have have had parents where yeah. where they you know they they've I get phone calls or emails that they're like, oh, you know, this isn't my fault or how dare them give my kid a B on this yeah. or, or they get a detention or whatever. And, um, again, I think you got to remember that, that to those parents, they, those kids are their entire life. You know, you know, my, I'm usually I'm, my life is, is hundreds or if not thousands of kids. And, um, I think that if you interact with those parents constructively and you explain the rationale and you don't, you know, grow defensive and you either talk face to face or on the phone, not through emails where things right. could be misconstrued and the ambiguity keyboard. can yeah, yeah, the keyboard, keyboard courage, courage again. <laughs> then, um, then usually, you know, the, if, if you create with the parents who are actually putting up that resistance, if you create that camaraderie that we're on a team to try to turn your kid into the smartest, most responsible individual that we can, you know, kind of a citizen of this world, then, then, then they're more responsive of that. And they realize that you're not just trying to run a power trip or say that their kid's a bad kid or they're an irresponsible parent. Right. Yeah. Well, because at the same time, I mean, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be the first to say, I mean, I picked music for a living. Man, it really sucks most of the time, to be honest. But mm-hmm. but my respect goes out to two 
two professions and I say professions and I know normally that means making money, Mm -hmm. but two professions, one of which a teacher Mm -hmm. hands down and the other being a parent, both of them technically cost money sometimes more than they make money and yeah. And And, energy and, and, and and, 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 yeah, because it's a completely different kind of wealth. And, uh, me myself, I cannot hold a candle to either profession. And I feel like there's such a connection between those two. There's so many parallels between parent and teacher too. And I think sometimes maybe that's where the heads butt because when the kid leaves home, the teacher actually really does become the parent. The responsibility is in your hands to nurture that child and not necessarily even nurture it, nurture the child, but to really show that child the way. And sometimes depending on, as you said, the upbringing and the household, sometimes I guarantee, George, that you are that kid's father or you are that kid's mother more so than what they even have to go home to. Yeah, yeah, and I think everybody has the ability to be a mentor uh, in in some way or another. You know, just just by taking an interest in a kid that is somehow in your life and and and, and you know pushing them to be their best or encouraging them to pursue the things that you think they're capable of. Um, but I, but I can tell you, so I'm a vice principal of an elementary school this year. This is my first year working in an elementary school, which has been basically like a year long ep, uh, kindergarten cop screening for me. And it's, I mean, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. They're, thank you. They're, uh, and it, it's funny and adorable and, and gross. They're, it's they're not really gross. Yeah. Yeah. Every day is something like that. These kids, and I, I can tell you actually some pretty hysterical stories about that, but, uh, going into it, I will say that I was even guilty of being a high school teacher before that. I would look at these and you know, how hard could it be to be an elementary school teacher, you know the answer to every question they're going to ask you. You've got a book that's got the answer to every question if you don't know. And they're just little kids. They're afraid of you. Being an elementary school teacher is one of the most insanely hard things <laughs> I've ever seen. I will go in and I'll like sub for an hour for the kindergarten. And it's just chaos, man. Every moment in that classroom is just absolute chaos. And these teachers have found ways to not only control the room and, and to teach responsibility, but to educate. And and I think that uh, if we, as a, as a country, had a little more respect for what teachers do, because I mean, there is, this, you know, we've heard the saying, those who can will and those who can't teach. That's incredibly insulting, because this is a really, really hard job. And I, and I feel more capable of saying that because I'm now at the administrative end. And so I'm talking about you know, the, the people that either work beneath me or, or, you know, kind of my colleagues, I'm not talking about myself and patting myself on the back. I'm watching these teachers from the outside. It is an incredibly hard job and they're doing it for a a very unreasonable salary because they love it, you know, or, or because they want to do something with it. Yeah. And so the fact that you have admiration for it, I think that if everybody did it and had a certain amount of prestige, you know, I know there's uh, countries like Finland where being a teacher is on the same plane as, you know, you go home and you tell your, your parents, hey, I'm, I'm dating a teacher. It'd be like you said, hey, I'm dating a doctor. I'm dating a lawyer. Right. And that does not exist here, you know. Which you, is crazy it, to it, me. It's, it's crazy to me, too. Well, think, like, think, think about how much, and this is not a diss on any other, you know, it's, it's, it's the facts. Mm-hmm. Think about how much, like, an NFL player makes. Uh-huh. I mean, and I'm sure you've thought about this and, you know, punched the wall over this and, and even, <laughs> right. you know, scratched your head so many times. And it's just like, but think about it. I'm like, that NFL player who has six to ten years tops before he, you know, scrambles his brains, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's an exceptional talent. You have to, I mean, it's exceptional talent, a lot of hard work, a lot, a lot of, of devotion. You yep. sacrifice your life. You're, you're essentially a circus freak for, you know, a good portion of your life. But you normally get to retire before 40 mm-hmm. uh, and live in, you know, bigger houses uh, and take better vacations than most people will ever even succumb to. In three lifetimes, uh, living in the world, and, and everybody says, you know, but that's because that's consumerism, you know, blah 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 blah. They're willing to pay, so they're willing to put these prices. And I'm like, yeah, but like they're shaping somebody's Sunday afternoon, whereas teachers are shaping somebody's entire life. Yeah, and and, and, and then therefore in shaping the entire world. Like, think about that. Yeah, it's a big influence, <laughs> like, and uh, you know, and not even <laughs> not even you know comparing it to to any other career or something that's yeah. really tough about uh, to about being a teacher is they've we've got pay scales in this industry, and so you look you look at a column 
and you say, hey, if you have this level of education, bachelor's, master's, doctorate, and you've been in it for this number of years, you can literally see on a piece of paper the amount of money you will make for the rest of your life, no matter how good you are. And it does not, and typically it does not break 90 grand. If, if you've been in there for like 30 years and you have a doctorate, like you're going to be right around 90 grand yeah. maybe, you know, on average. And so that that alone is a little bit, you know, disconcerting that, that you're like, so what if I do really, really well though? <laughs> like what if all of my kids become like these amazing professions and these incredible people and I change their lives to the better? Like then do I get more? It's like, no, you're going to make the same amount as, as somebody who just kind of shows up and, and gives them more sheets. You'll, you'll always make the same amount. So it's, it's But we'll um, give you a plaque on the wall though. Maybe. Yeah, if you're yeah. lucky, yeah. Maybe. Follow us at jakepaluski.com. That's P I L E W S K I. Listening.